Okay, so good morning everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Elena Bacan. I am an assistant professor at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. Uh, I work at the Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences, which is based in Florence. Uh, three years ago, the Scuola Normale Superiore, which used to be only in Pisa, also opened a third class um, in, in Florence. Uh, and that is where I work uh, within the Cosmos, uh, you see the logo down there, uh, the Cosmos Group, which is the Center of Social Movement Studies. Um, uh, I run there a, a project that is called Makers, uh, that stands for Movement as Knowledge Producers in the Digital Age. And uh, since I've started to do this work uh, as a researcher and a junior scholar, uh, I've always been working uh, at the crossroads of different fields, the first one being social movement and social movement studies, and the second one being media studies and communication studies. I've always uh, uh, preferred to approach the crossroads between these two different fields by looking at media as object for collective mobilization. Um, so, where uh, when I began uh, to do my research, I was uh, doing my MA uh, in Communication Sciences and I studied the process uh, that maybe some of you might know. Uh, it was called the World Summit of the Information Society. It was after quite a while that the United Nations did not deal with uh, media issues as uh, central issues for our contemporary society. That process was the first time in which the United Nations tried to reach uh, share documents between governments, the private sector, and um, civil society. And a very peculiar uh, five-year process um, emerged in that occasion. And um, what I did was using social movement theories to investigate how actually government, the governments, the private sector, and civil society come together and come to a shared frame uh, that, it, that is then crystallized within a uh, shared document on how this contemporary information society or our societies should, should be. Um, that was the process that actually kicked off a process that you might be more familiar with, that it's called Internet Governance Forum. Uh, the Internet Governance Forum started in 2006 and it has reached now its 11th edition. It's an itinerant process that every year changes a uh, uh, point in space where it's held. Uh, and it's again uh, a place, a space where governments, uh, the private sector, academia, which in, in, in this time frame has become like an independent sector, and civil society organization come together and discuss the issue of the uh, of internet governance in all of its facets. That was the place where um, a very tough negotiation happened to put at the same level human rights such as access to infrastructure, um, uh, need for digital skills at the same level as network uh, protection, net neutrality, infrastructure security. So composing technical and um, technical and, and, and social issues together. Um, that was something that I studied for my PhD, um, again using uh, movement literature um, and, and investigating different dimension of what it meant to work together, which is what I do also uh, now. So tracing online and offline networks of interactions between um, uh, different uh, constituencies, different uh, agendas, different needs. Um, and this is what has actually always, um, let's say, the two binaries along which I've been working and the reason why I'm in contact with the next uh, center on internet uh, and society is precisely because I've always been uh, trying to understand how these networks of interaction actually result in something mm -hmm. that is collective. So whether it's a vision uh, for information societies or it's a common vision for internet governance and the like, um, so what I want to uh, do with you, with you today, um, first because we're not so many, I would uh, like to know, um, well you, you, you can remain anonymous, because the thing it's not about names, but um, you can tell me uh, where you 
come from in the sense of what you study, what you research, what you what you like, and, and actually why you're here, because uh, that will help me a lot uh, framing the rest of my presentation. Um, it's going to be fairly unconventional for those of you who come from the technical field, because even if I've been working at the crossroads between different fields, I remain a sociologist by uh, for momentous, I would say. Uh, and so what I want to do with you today is sharing uh, part of the reflection that we have developed along this year, especially since 2010, I would say, uh, on the nexus between digital media that in this context means all sort of digitally enabled infrastructure from the internet on, but think about digital media as something that approaches not as truly as synonymous, but something very close to social media, because uh, social media is what has actually caused a, a true turning point because we, everybody is able to speak their mind and to, to take a stand, uh, also a political stand. Uh, and I want to share with you this reflection and I wanted to um, I want to share with you some conceptual uh, tools that I hope can become part of, your, of the toolkit that you put in place and you pull out every time that you decide that you want to actually investigate or build a platform uh, in a civic tech initiative uh, on what it means uh, to, uh, um, to have social movement in the digital age, what is the nexus between the two. So I don't, I'm not very good at directing people, but front row has always a burden on their shoulders, so you kick off and just tell me what you want about you, but just... Um, I'm Pasquale Pellegrino and I work for uh, Nexus Center mm -hmm. as a dissemination manager for a European project uh, studying uh, how IoT developer mm -hmm. uh, enacts ethics value in, uh, uh, in building and in uh, developing new and your background is? My background is in uh, political science okay. and uh, political communication. Okay. Uh, I am Federico Casassa. I am a PhD attendant in metrology. Uh -huh. And uh, I, mm, I can say I mm, don't have uh, um, academic interest in the courses, but it's a personal interest. Okay. And I, I see the, the, the synopsis of the courses and uh, I was very interested. So, yeah. I, I, I am a, a physicist. I have a, a master degree in physics. Peace. Hi, uh, I am Jawad, and I am the master of uh, computer engineering. Okay. Yes, I'm a student. And uh, today it was a suddenly happened, and I, it is very related to my interest. Uh, I'm here to as as anything as I can about the social movements, anything related, yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Francesco and I'm a PhD in urban and regional development. Okay. And during my research, I, I faced with some issues related to digital aspects of, I'm, I'm searching in building information modeling mm -hmm. in, for infrastructure design. And in facing with the, uh, the transition from the traditional process to the digital process mm -hmm. in construction, mm -hmm. and I would like to know something else about how society and now in general uh, digital objects are considered. So I would like to understand something more. This is shift to the back of the room. Hi, my name is Mario. Uh, I'm a designer and uh, I'm working on a device for capture the stress level of a user. The stress level? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to biological... target a user? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want to use the non-verbal communication. Okay. So I think this course can be useful. So, okay. <clears throat> I'm Daniele Grosso from the Energy Department of uh, Polytechnico. I'm a nuclear engineer. Nice. Uh, the main topics of my research are uh, energy modeling, security of energy infrastructures, uh, future scenarios on uh, energy. 
Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I'm involved in the PhD in energetics, and so I'm attending this course uh, in order to learn something about the, the internet and society topics. Very nice. Maybe the next people also want to join. <laughs> My name is Mattia Plazio, I'm uh, the managing director of the uh, Nexus Center. And I come from um, humanistic studies. Uh, I study cinema, literature, so I'm far from these themes. Okay. I'm Francesco Ruggero, I'm the communication manager at Nexus Center, and I've studied uh, contemporary Italian contemporary literature and uh, comparative literature. And uh, I'm Giovanni Garifo, and uh, I'm the team manager of the Nexus Center. And I'm also a student, a master degree student in computer engineer at the Polytechnic. Okay, so um, we have, uh, as, as usually happens, like quite a diverse crowd, um, and I think that this is very representative of, of of what it means to study our societies today, and what it, and and why it is important to take an angle specifically on digital media because digital media is actually what is to a, an unprecedented extent because we've always been together, but to put in communication the different facet of our society, the different agenda, the different needs, the different perceptions. So um, it is something that it's relevant to all of us. Um, at the same time, I have uh, the deep uh, conviction that social movement also are something that have always been relevant to our society. Um, and, and this is very much a personal slash biased opinion, but political participation it is in democratic and more uh, relevantly also in authoritarian societies, something that is a concern for all of us. It's very, very important then to reason at the crossroad of two things that are so um, structuring, so fundamental to the pre our present, they have been fundamental in the past, media in general, not so much digital media because it's a thing of today, and that would definitely shape our future. One of the things that a fringe of us scholars working on social movements um, on the media perspective is entering the big data field and working together with physicists and computer engineering in order to find out what it really means to um, put together in a, in a seamless, I would say, uh, relationship, a technological infrastructure and a way of building future scenarios. Um, one of the things that I like the most about social movement, it's something that was said about social movement a long time, well, 20 years ago, because if I say a long time ago, having in mind 1996, it would mean that I would be super, super old. So, some time ago. It was said uh, by Alberto Melucci, one of the most prominent scholars in the field of social movement, that social movements are prophets of the present. I don't know if you ever thought about it in those terms, but pro being a prophet of the present means that you live in your contemporary society, but you live in a different way. And you put in practice a vision for a different future that it's not just something that you are that you want to achieve, but it's something that you can put in practice, it's something that exists. It's a way of showing in practice, conceptualizing first and then showing into practice that another world is possible. It's not random that the slogan of the word social forum is always being another world is possible because they do show us, social movement do show us that there's another way. When, so, when digital media and social media came into the picture and internet at first, internet has big has been big for the uh, world social forum and the global justice movement to connect together all the dots of this different vision for this other world. When digital media have come into the picture, every single person which had a smartphone, some data connection, or even a laptop or a tablet, or it has been infected by the Apple mania and had an iPhone or whatever else, uh, actually became part, a weaker or a stronger part in a collective system that is enacting a different future. And it's a future that we build in practice every single day. 
this is actually um, uh, not something, it, it is something that has reached today an unprecedented level, as I was saying before. And this is the reason why we're discussing so, um, uh, so thoroughly the nexus between social movement and digital media. But if I have to be honest with you, the question, how are digital media important for social movement studies, has been there forever. We just changed the media part in the question. So when uh, social movement scholars begin to study contemporary social movement in the 60s and the 70s, of course, it was the press. And then came the television as a mass media and then the websites, and then the digital media, and now also big data. So the question has been, yes, it was supposed to come. No, 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 <laughs> because he always freaks out people like this. Um, so it, it is something that it's always been there. Always been there in the sense that media in a contemporary society have always been fundamental. And are always been a part of the context in which social movement have great, uh, risen and thrived. Every single media, though, has played a different role. And movement have been able to appropriate and strategically use this media to different extents. So one of the first points that I want to make absolutely clear today, it's not that having a concern about digital media and social movement today is not um, having a concern on something that has not existed before. We have a past of media existence we have a past of interactions between the media system and civil society and the people. We have an, a very complex interaction of media with political participation. You might not be familiar with this distinction, but social movement are in fact a way of participating politically that we used in the past uh, to call unconventional political participation. Whereas the conventional part is voting, contacting your parliament members, sending emails to your representative. The unconventional part is exiting the box, thinking outside the box, coming together and proving that political change is possible in a different form. Okay? Um, this complex system of different scenarios and active and practices has always been um, related to the media sphere. Just think about, about the fact that before the internet, you did learn about social movement in other places through the television, through the press. And so a lot of the collective endeavors put forward by the movement have been conditioned by the ways in which media have portrayed the movement as legitimate or illegitimate actors, as a minoritarian effort or something very important, as something that has to be condemned or something that has to be supported. So in the past, if we've been reasoning about the nexus between media in general and the movements. But when digital media came into the picture, all in a sudden, everybody was concerned about what is the role, what is the importance of this new type of media, whether new, of course, uh, is something that the label of new is something that is real or not. Uh, so the, hate, the hype came into the scene. So suddenly, after the Arab Spring, we had social movements everywhere. We had the Arab Springs, we had Syriza, we had the Five Star Movement here in Italy, we had Occupy Wall Street, we even had Occupy Tundra. A bunch of people occupying the Tundra in defense of the ecosystem. We had something that then turned out to be Occupy everywhere. Okay? And that has been called the Twitter revolution age. At that point, the hype, which was super high and got established in only a few years, was that social media caused revolution. There's, there's nothing more false than this statement. Men and women do the revolution. Men and women, other genders, humans do. Humans have desire for change. They do achieve, try to achieve their dreams and their hopes and their programs of change in the context where they move. Digital media are a pervasive part of this context, so they cannot be left outside. But the political project is a human project. 
The difference between digital media and previous types of media is that digital media, and you know if you're a programmer, have an agency. So digital media do things together with the humans. They serve us a list of news that we have to skim through. They suggest possible friends. They deliver for us messages that we were supposed to send via snail mail and would take ages to reach, possibly not even reaching the rest of the world. So digital media are doing things for us, but we had so many dramatic events over the past years, okay, that I, and, and we had this novelty of this new media, and everything all in a sudden became, well, had this flavor of being something new. It wasn't. Revolution had been there before. Think about the French Revolution. It's the biggest thing that, that has ever happened. It's the a crib of human rights. It's a project of changing the entire war system, which at the time was quite limited in terms of space uh, and mindset, but it happened without the internet. So there is no need to say that today's will for change is something that is brought about, that is caused by social media. This is super important to keep in mind. Nonetheless, because things have happened in a completely different media scape, as we call it, the attention that we had for this project of change has become something new, something that um, um, attracted our attention. Another very important distinction that has to be made if we want to understand the nexus between social movement and digital media is that not everything that happens online is a social movement. To be fair, few instances of movement even exist now if we really want to keep the idea of movement attached to what the social movement studies field had taught us that movement are. Okay? There is no other way of getting organized in the online space that is not a network. Okay? Because the network is actually the first thing that comes in place online. The online space is a network space, so there is no other thing that is not a network. But not all networks are movements. Think about what happened before the internet in our life. We had networks of friends, network of colleagues, we did not build a social movement with all of them. So having a network means having a crowd. Not all crowd are movements. In fact, if we want to know how the social movement field emerged, it took a very long time to move away from the idea that social movement were a collective behavior, a disordered behavior like panic or masses. Social movement are a rational, planned effort to bring along social change. It's getting closer again to a crowd idea in the moment in which we have millions of people taking part of them, and we do not have just a usual suspect like big NGOs or a big platform. Think about attack. Think about Amnesty International. Okay, large scale uh, women's rights organization. We have women. We have refugees taking part of that. So we're kind of in the middle between a, a crowd, but it's a thinking crowd. If you go in the square, like the, the episode that happened here in in Turin. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, where a crowd panicked and everybody moved without thinking that it's not a movement. Okay? But that approximates very much what happens in the online space every day. There are people just shooting tweets, posting pictures. Okay? That, that is, is, it's collective, but it's not a collective effort. So it's very important not to overestimate the change that the Jasmine can bring about when it comes to um, political change. Moreover, we also have the possibility, well, we do have these networks then, okay? And these networks are a carrier of projects. And this is why I like to work with physicists lately, because we've been reasoning about how social movements spread and diffuse, like think about the Arab Springs, for example, the hashtag spreading in the MENA region and bringing the revolution from Tunisia to Yemen in only a very uh, limited time span. The fact that the hashtag traveled, so that percolation, that diffusion, 
or as the physicists would say, a contagion effect or a seismic effect, is not tantamount to bringing the revolution from Tunisia to Yemen. It's not easy to get on the revolutionary side in Yemen, neither it is in Tunisia. You have to face the risk, like I also did, of being burned alive. So we have a contagion effect at the level of discourse, at the level of discourse, but how that relates with social change, that it's another, uh, and social participation, that it's another open, very open question. Um, there's certainly an effect that we are not able to quantify because it changes all the times between exposure to information and the fact that we participate. How many of you have signed an online petition lately? I sign a petition almost every day. How many of you have gone to the squares for testing? That's often, okay? But signing a petition is something that you might do fairly often, but you don't do it every day. At least you choose to sign a petition. You choose to share a video from Occupy Democrats. I do not share a video from the Nigger North, and I will get up being recorded here. So I'm saying it, I admit it. I don't share, I agree, I'm exposed to the information of the Nigger North on Facebook, but I don't share it. I'm exposed to Occupy Democrats, and I share. It's my choice. So the type of political participation forms that we enact in a very highly mediated environment are definitely different. But it's a form of engagement nonetheless. It's weak, it's being called slacktivism, being activist in your pajama. And let's be honest, going to the square and protesting, it's huge. If you have never done it, get informed, find a cause that you want to support, and go with the people and feel the energy of bringing along change onto them. And it's awesome, but it's also super cool to get informed in your pyjama with your coffee and thinking that you're doing something every single minute of your life, whether you're wearing your pyjama, your trousers, your socks, drinking coffee, watching television, and whatever. Being constantly engaged, it doesn't mean being constantly on the square. It means being engaged with the brain and with the tools that allow your brain to project this idea of social change. Social movement and digital media have a, we've been studying this for quite some time now. Um, there are related fields that have all in a sudden become very prominent because, especially what happened in the States with the election of Donald Trump, fake news, post truth, alternative facts, okay? The fact that everybody can tell you their version of the story and you have no base to assess whether this story is the true story or another story. Is it what happened? In the old, good times of traditional journalism, we used to wonder about what is a fact. Okay? And we had the idea that if you can prove it, that it happened, it was a fact. Now everybody has a proof for a different fact on the same event. So we're kind of lost in this variety, and we don't know where political truth stands, and we don't know where political um, trust uh, can be built upon. Okay? We've been dealing in social movement studies with the secular genius for quite some time now, so I think although political communication and social movements are uh, kind of Related disciplines are not the same discipline. I think that we have a lot to learn from each other. And so, this this three reason the fact that there have been huge uh, dramatic attempts to bring along social change, the fact that we have this diffusion of this media, and this media are actually able to diffuse information to a very rap very rapidly and to a very large extent, and the fact that it connects to all of other all other spheres of political participation are the reason why we should care about the hype. Because before becoming a hype, it was a very important reality. So we have to get rid of a little bit of the hype and concentrate on what is real and what is not. So what I want to do today, and uh, I hope we have the time to do this uh, 
not rushing too much, is going through three different things. I want with you to take a step back and clarify the terms of the discussion. What is a social movement? What are digital media? And why we should, uh, and how we can think at the crossroad between these two. I want to tell you what we have learned in this few years about the relevance of digital media for social movement in terms of predictors of mobilization. So, you know, we sociologists are always obsessed with explaining things, explaining why things happen, and so we've always been looking for predictors. Who mobilizes? Why do they mobilize? When do they mobilize? Okay? How collective efforts are organized? How do we come together and try to achieve change? What is this change about? What is our collective identity? What is that holds us together? And how does the media intersect all these three levels? And, as, and then I want to jump a little bit more on what I like the most, which is treating digital media as the object of the contestation, which is something that, um, especially for those of you who work in planning and programming new, new tools, um, can come handy because whenever you do something that deals with data, you will find data activists around probably blaming you or clapping hands at you if you did things in a certain, uh, uh, in a certain way. So let's get started. Um, you would recognize the Shakespearean quote, much of it about what? So I would be very curious to, to know what you think a social movement is. And if you can give me an example of movements that you see around you today, just one, one bright person that tells me what is a social movement. And if you can think of a social movement today, So the rule says that we have to wait 25 seconds, but it's just too much. I will tell you that social movement is one specific way of acting collectively. So we have a prior category that is called collective action. Collective action holds together different forms of or getting organized to get social change together. One of them is social movement. But more in general, Collective action is a set of practices, things that we do. Okay? Not just things that we imagine, but things that we want to translate and profit of the presence that I was the present that I was saying before. A set of uh, social practices that not simultaneously. The key of being together is simultaneity. A number of individuals and groups, here comes the or by exhibiting similar morphological characteristics in continuity of time and space. We have to be together and we have to be recognizable. That is what is behind this sentence. If we stand together, individuals and group, and we're similar because we're chanting, we're showing signs, we're tweeting the protest hashtag, we're sending fake requests for a denial of service, okay? We are exhibiting similar morphological characteristics, implying a social field of relationship because we do it together. So I do it with you, and I do it with you, and you do it with him, and you do it with him, okay? And we get in contact. This is why social network analysis is so important to social movement studies because we can trace this field of relationships and the capacity of people of making sense of what they're doing. So we can do things together. We can do it in a network, but we have to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay. A social so all collective action more or less share these characteristics. Social movement are something like this, but with a rather very long term vision. Think about the peace movement. Think about women's rights movement, LGBTQI plus movements. Okay. Those are the movements that exist. The worker movements, work justice, equal opportunities, equal pay. Okay, those are all movements that existed before and continue to exist today. Why? Because we haven't achieved peace. Because we haven't achieved gender equality. We didn't achieve a work justice, equal pay. None of that. If you work in the university, you don't. Especially. So. 
social movement are collective effort geared toward a long-term change. What it takes someone, how, how long it takes to achieve pace, at least, is something that nobody knows. How much it takes to a single person to keep standing for peace all of their lives without seeing any result whatsoever, it's still a mystery. People do get committed for their whole lifetime to a movement cause. You're not today a peace activist and tomorrow a real peace activist and tomorrow lobbying for the National Rifle Association. You are part of the movement for the rest of your life. That's why we, we are so concerned with the bio, biographical impacts of social movements. Mm -hmm. more, more simply, a social movement is a coordination on behalf of shared interest and program. The key being the share. Okay? If I ask you what you think it is peace, each of you will give it a different um, interpretation. If I ask you about gender equality, we don't even want to get started on that. How do we come to a minimum human denominator that allows us to identify a target, identify a strategy, and move? Okay? That is one of the most difficult things. And social media, digital media, have been fundamental of showing to the people that we actually share impressions. Think about the 99%. It's the 99% of the world. There's a whole world in that 99%. And yet, they were, be a they were able to recognize that at least the common target was the 1%. Okay? And that was all supported by Twitter. Okay? So, in the end, it's a form of solidarity. Solidarity network. It's a way of coming together and saying, we act together because I feel you. And I feel you because I share your condition. We, used, we, we had social movements shaped like this all of the time. You see, these definitions from the root chains from 1996, as I said before, internet was just starting then. Okay? So this is at the, at the basis of coming together within social movements. The fact is that when digital media came into the picture, all of this was exploding because we saw instances of actions everywhere and we were exposed to instances and claims coming from places of the world that we didn't even know that existed. We didn't know that things were going so badly in Egypt. We thought about Egypt as a place of pyramids and things like that, but Egypt never crashed on television. So 8 p.m. have them dinner. How many times have you heard things about Egypt? Never. All of a sudden, on digital media, you became aware. Okay. So the sense of the group is much much bigger, in the sense that it's all of digital media users. The similarity that we find are million and heterogeneous. I am similar to many people in many different ways based on the behavior that I see exposed in the online networks. Social fields of relations, it's all about connections in the end when it comes to digital media, right? And then making sense of what we're doing, that's the hard part because each of us has a claim that their unique situation is more worthy than the others. But then in the end, we always come to an agreement. So we understood that at least to change neoliberal extreme setting and to contrast populism, the one percent was this, the target. That was enough. Well, from somewhere you have to start, right? What are digital media? So, one of the hardest things to do is to define digital media beyond the platform that we use. So, if I tell you what is digital media, you would tell me Facebook, you would tell me Twitter. That is just one practical realization. It's an app, it's a service. Digital media is something that functions in a specific way and is simultaneously a thing that you use, the practice that you enact by using the thing, and the social arrangement that regulate the thing that you can do. Meaning, digital media are Facebook, 
the thing that you do on Facebook and the governance system that regulates Facebook. And before Facebook, that regulates IPv addresses distribution, domain assignation. Okay? So digital media is more than the thing that you hold in your hands. It's you through the tool that you use, and it's you through the tool that you use inserted in a context of rules that someone else has decided for you. You don't need to go to the level of internet governance to understand this point. Think about terms of use. You are not supposed to use Facebook to sell things to people. That is a term of use. Okay? But that's part of your digital the of the digital media itself. Okay? The, and you cannot transcend from that. So every time that we think digital media attached to social movement, we have to think about the impact that the tool gives to us, connecting with other people, bridging different networks, creating new community, that's the thing that these things do. The activities that activists, or every citizen for that matter, can do with Facebook, and the rules that people have to obey to, or want to try to change when it comes to the use of Facebook. Okay? So for one thing that you bring into the picture, you already have three different levels that you have to think of. And you cannot think that every activist will do, will make the same use of the same object. That is the key. When you hear on television commenting things that have happened through the mediation, you say, the Twitter crowd, the Twitter people, who are these people? How do they use Twitter? Why do they use Twitter? There is no such thing as all Twitter users using the tool in the same way at the same time. This is simply irrealistic. It doesn't exist. And it actually is the easiest way of taking out responsibilities for what happens in the online space. There is social agency there. Okay? If you tweet something stupid, Kofefe will ring a bell in your head. If you tweet Kofefe, it's not Twitter that did that. It's you doing that. You have the responsibility for that. And you have to take um, on this responsibility. Okay? You, you do not have a press secretary that tells you that just a restrict number of people knows what Kofefe means. It means nothing. It was a mistake. Okay? And it's the tool that allows you to make that mistake, but then it's your action that matters. Okay? So, in fact, thinking about digital media as this multifaceted object brings uh, back the discussion to a vision of technology as a multilayer concept that is typical of what we call uh, science and technology studies, SDS. It's a discipline that has highly debated a lot with communication media studies and social movement studies lately, for which every technology that you can think of, from a bridge to a hammer to digital media, can see as an artifact, a practice, and a knowledge around that artifact and practice. Okay? Think about every object that you use, every technology that you even your bicycle. There's a thing with wheels, there's you riding the thing with it, um, with the wheels, and that it's you knowing where to go, how to jump on it, direction, how to turn uh, the thing to go right or left. Okay? Everything can be thought in those terms. So, what is the point? Why are we so concerned about digital media? Because even if they're done by an artifact, a practice, and a piece of knowledge or rules, the material of the thing and the social practice are entangled. So entangled is a very good verb in English because it's just not implicating a thing. Entangling things means doing something new with two different things in the beginning. It's not just creating, it's really creating something new. So um, in terms of constitutive entanglement, which is the basis of what we call social technical approach, so Facebook activism is by definition a social technical approach because I cannot be active digitally without the service that allows me to be active online. So it's fully social technical. Okay. Um, 
it has a lot of implication. Think about in your daily life, outside your political activism, um, WhatsApp and the blue checks. Okay? So you send a message, the people, uh, the person who received this message reads it, and you get the checks. What happens? You start waiting. And you expect an answer immediately. So that type of expectation is something that we didn't have in the past, and it's a socio-technical expectation. You wouldn't be waiting if the system wouldn't tell you that the person has read. You had the forward expectation on something, but now you demand quickly in response. And if they don't respond to you, then that expectation is failed. So you keep sending messages and messages and messages. This is the key to digital media activism. The tool allows you to do things that you were not able to do before, connecting with other people, sharing vision, sharing thoughts, and you create a new expectation. So this is the first thing. Hybrid recombinant technologies, how many things can you do just for Twitter? How quickly does Twitter change for you, together with you? This is the key to all the Web 2.0, okay? The permanently beta version that attaches new meaning, new possibilities to your expectation, to correct the problems, to allow you for all these new things, bridging, taking, learning, stealing from other technologies, okay? Networks of networks. My network on Facebook, on Twitter, on Lumio, whatever platform you want to think of is a part of a bigger network. And it's always possible to travel, physicists will know very well this, from one area to the network through another area of the network. That raises a very huge question on who are the intermediaries? Who are the nodes that allow me to get in contact with a new crowd of people that I want to build an alternative with? Digital media are ubiquitous here in the Northwest. Not in Africa, not in Asia. Latin America, not everywhere. There is a very fascinating discipline, which is the geopolitics of internet cables, and I encourage you to go and see how uh, overseas cables are laid down on the ground, that it's, you will see the commercial routes are all there. And the terrestrial cables, they don't even do a map because there are too many, but there are areas that are completely empty. They're completely empty because they're difficult areas to be cabled, but they're completely empty because they're not interesting markets. Okay? So the ubiquity of the of the Twitter revolution must be thought in conjunction with a new, harsh, and ever-existing digital divide, which is, first of all, a divided term of access. Interaction. Interaction is the key to participation, to collective participation. If I don't know you, if I don't interact with you, we don't build anything together. So the very fact that social media, digital media now allow you to interact with whom, whomever, and access, it's the key to political participation. Um, at this point, we had offline networks and activism, and we've always been um, in that situation. At one point, we got all this online thing, and there was a tension. There were people who said, online, everything is happening, nothing is happening in the square anymore. Tahir Square was a square. There was Twitter before, during, and afterward, but the year square was the year square. So the tension is not even necessary. The Arab Spring were both simultaneously online and offline. And it was at the same time something that was centered around humans and driven by the technology. There is no need to put social movement in any of these corners. Social movement and digital media must stand at a crossroad between an artificial tension between online and offline and humans and technology. Because mediated activism is something that spurs right at a crossroad between these dimensions. You will find people that will tell you that what happens online is the most important thing. 
Manuel Castells, very prominent scholar that wrote a book, uh, Networks of Outrage and Hope, said to us that the Indignados movement was a proof of a new form of social power. Social power built through discourse, and social power that is, and that is an alternative to coercive power and power enacted by the state. So Manuel Castells was, he is super enthusiastic, and he is saying, Everything that we say together online will bring along change, and that is a form of power. I don't deny that, but it's slightly more complicated than that. Because, as I said before, not everything that we say, not everything that we do, brings along something like the Indignados. And the Indignados thrived with this networks of mass self communication. Then the Indignados won the administrative election, and now the Indignados are dealing with administrative politics. That's another challenge. Okay? So, whatever happens in the online space does not exhaust the collective effort. Not everything that happens offline exhausts the totality of collective efforts today. It's something that stands precisely in the middle. At the beginning, we were trying to understand how the online changes the square. Then we started to think about the online as something that happens per se, and it's a form of protest in its own. Anonymous is the thing that we started to look to understand better at this point. And now we're trying to understand how what happens in the Twitter sphere affect or is affected by what happens offline. Think about something that it's not a movement, even if they call them themselves in this way, the anti-vaccination protest here in Italy. That is not a movement, for sure. It's a bunch of people who share an opinion and have in one certain type of, it's at best a coalition, maybe, okay? But how is this Facebook discussion about vaccination influencing the fact that then people do not vaccinate their kids, okay? The other way around, technology or human, where do we stand? We have to stand in the middle. It is definitely true that digital media have all the characteristics that you know that are unique to them, but it's also true that if nobody uses digital media, they don't serve any purpose. And digital media were created because people felt that the previous media setting, that the media environment before was not enough for what they wanted to do. And simply digital media came as a tool because people like you could program, realize another type of media. So it's a human thing, okay? And we tweet, and we post, and we share, and we take humor, or we geolocate, because we need to, because we want to know, okay? And give someone a very fast car, and they would ride, even in a very country uh, road, super quickly. You cannot give a supercar to someone and just say, just walk beside it, okay? Once you start driving fast, you like velocity. It's, it's human, okay? But because we've, we're humans, we know ourselves, we know that we can control this. We know what our pulsions are. And we know that if we build tools that perform tasks on their own, like ranking results in Google, Okay. We have always to be aware of how it works, otherwise we are playing unfair. So, you would have understand by now that the place where, where I stand personally, where many of us are doing research in this field stand, is somewhere in the middle between people like this, you know, this guy, this clay shirky, organizing with our organization, the power of the crowd, the power of the masses, we will do everything together without needing the WWF anymore, or human women, or the Red Cross for that matter. We are us on Twitter, together, united, everywhere. And this guy here, Eugenie Morozov. Eugenie Morozov is the cyber skeptic by default. He wrote this amazing, tremendously uh, lucid book that is called The Net Delusion. It's true. So you have a system that allows you to turn amateurs into protagonists quickly, cheaply, immediately. Okay? And that works. Is there an emergency? Tweet away. 
is there a street practice? You were saying that you do uh, urban design. Digital media are crucial to street manifestation because they allow people to enact what is called sous-surveillance. From the bottom up, surveilling the police, telling people where the blockage are, where people is ready to be, and move the street demonstration somewhere else to avoid the physical clash between police and the activists. That it, GPS is a tremendous resource if you're trying to organize something in a physical space. Okay? You couldn't do that with the press, you couldn't do that with television. Okay? But you can do it now. You can use these tools to get organized. However, these tools are not only tools of the activists, these tools are the tools of the government. Morris wrote the book like 10 years ago almost. Now you have Trump. Trump is giving you proof that social media are considered or, or can be co-opted as governmental tools and upon entrance on the, in the states you have to give your social media credentials and if you don't give your social media credentials they're going to watch you nonetheless Edward Snowden, Wikileaks, they're, they're doing things to us, they're watching us and we know that on a daily basis, we don't care. But in fact, that's a matter. It's a very important matter. So, um, Eugene Morozov has this idea of the authoritarian deliberation. So, you think you're participating, but you're not in fact. They're just letting you participate to a certain extent, according to some rules. And you have the impression that you're free, but you're not. It's extreme. He's a skeptical. But he's not, um, he's not wrong, and Clay Shirk is not wrong either. Mm -hmm. So, stuck in the middle between these two things, we're facing something very dangerous, which is a communication reductionism. Communication reductionism is something that puts digital media in our minds as something that is very neutral, something that is a fetish because everything is new. Every time that something happens, it's the first time that it happens, but that it's not true. Um, we, understand, we underestimate <coughs> the fact that every platform is different, every algorithm is different, and every algorithm is acting on us in different ways. Conditioning, allowing, constraining our political participation. If you were to follow just Facebook algorithm for participating, you wouldn't be participating that much. But if I want to understand the Arab Spring, and if I take as a starting point the data that the Facebook API gives me, I would have one picture of the protest. That it's enabled by the affordances of Facebook. If I take as a starting point Twitter instead, I would have another part of the protest that, that it's enabled by the affordances of Twitter. They're not the same. And the choice from, of, on the side of activists of going one direction or another or both or somewhere else, it's a non-neutral choice. Technologies are not neutral. We do not approach them in neutral ways. And the way in which they enter social technically the protest dynamics is not neutral. Moreover, there is a dependency on the studies that we have done on the type of data that we can have. It doesn't matter how hard we claim that we understood what happened in the MENA region by working on 3 million tweets at a time. We are working with what Twitter allows us to work on. And it's not everything. Okay. So we're dependent on the policies of the companies that own this media to understand what is actually happening when it comes to political participation. Other problems, digital inequalities, reciprocity, and exchanging things, it doesn't mean that we build trust and commercialization. We are using tools very, very often where kittens are the thing to see. Or I learn to cook every day something new, like sandwiches or anything. It's a commercial space. A lot has been done and said within the movement whether to use Twitter as the point 
to get to the public. So, and the struggle is always the same. We are trying to set up an alternative also to large media corporations like Facebook and Twitter. But most people read news on Twitter and Facebook. How do we reach out to everybody if we really want to change neoliberal arrangement? Neoliberal arrangement, change calls for universal participation. Okay. We hate Facebook, but we have to use it. So the point is, how do we use it in an aware way? How do we tune a software, a platform, that is constraining us to something that we play in our advantage? There are three things that we usually do on a daily basis to go um, beyond uh, the problems of digital inequality, trust, and commercialization. One, it's what is called civic narcissism. I will tell you in a minute what it is. Second, the no filter solution. We represent ourselves directly. And third, the hybrid influence. So, the civic narcissism is a label that was um, proposed by Sisi Kupakarisi, a prominent scholar in the field of media and mobilizations. It goes along with personalization. So narcissism is something that very simply is what we do every day. We share with our friends the fact that we signed the petition or that we, uh, we share uh, the Occupy Democrats video and we display it to our friends, to our contacts. So we are playing the activist role and we're narcissistic in that because it's cool to be an activist, right? And we'll do it many times because we're narcissistic. We all are, okay? We like to have the like because they like what we do, right? Always. But when we do that, we also give an input for weak that it is to the public discussion. So it's not a matter of actually having the new public sphere, but it's prompting the public discussion, okay? It, it is a small responsibility that we take every time that we post something, that we share something, or that we produce political content. Okay. But it's not the less something that we do. So, maybe myself on my own, I don't generate that much change, but if we really do it all together, under the same hashtag, for example, then we might want to do the difference. One case in Italy that surprised me a lot, because I work on gender issues, and I do not see gender claims being welcomed so neatly. When, uh, a couple of months ago, television show uh, showed on screen a list of 10 reasons why you should marry an Eastern European woman and because she cleans, because even after she gave birth she, she turned back in crochet immediately and da 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 Twitter people without getting organized started with the hashtag close the show and the show was closed it was not closed because of an editorial mistake. It was closed because gender and women were insulted by the program. And that was welcoming the instances of gender claims into the decision to close the thing. And the activation was not done because the thing was stupid. It was done because it was gender offensive. Okay? So that was a, an achievement small one, but yet very important for us. At least we got rid of this show. And I'm recording again at this, and I'm saying it, I'm happy that happened. Um, direct representation. As I said at the beginning of this talk, media used to represent the movement. Now movement represents themselves, and they do also have problems in doing that. Think about um, Occupy, for example. <coughs> Occupy Wall Street, Occupy London, Occupy Paris, or the Louis de Boo, um, one of the more recent spin-off of that. Um, you have 99% of the world population and one official account. How do you manage to bring to be representative if all you can do is tweeting one thing at once with one point? How do you shape that one voice? So direct representation is a very uh, um, awesome possibility, but it's also very hard to achieve in practice. So Occupy people resolve that by giving themselves a list of uh, 
boots before tweeting with the official hashtag, uh, with the official account. Um, they succeeded more or less to keep that under control, but it was not spontaneous. Okay? It was not a spur of the moment. It was hyper calculated. It was rational. Hybrid influence, okay, we are using often commercial platform, but it's the tail of the platform that it's using it and possibly reverting it, okay? So it's not having a public sphere in the term, in the sense of Habermas, I don't know if you know Jürgen Habermas, but he's the theorist behind the idea of the public sphere as the space in which citizens watch and comment and decide if governance, if governors are behaving correctly or if it's the case that we bring along some social change. It's something more very idealistic, it doesn't exist. Okay. So it's not true that there's a media are a public sphere, they're a public space where even the use of highly commercialized platform can become a resource in the hands of those who have always been excluded from the public discussion. And governments cannot ignore that. If you have the chance to trace and analyze the flows of tweets that go to the well, not this one, not not this president of uh, our prime minister, not this one, but the previous one, without NT, he was all over social media. See how many tweets he received every day, and see how many times he replies. Never, at least not to people, to other politicians, yes. But that piece of interaction tells you a lot of how, at one point or another, the expectation of receiving an answer from the citizens was actually disappointed, and people actually stopped tweeting it because he would not listen anyhow. Okay? What is to be done? You recognize the quotation, I hope. <coughs> Going back to the building blocks. Social movement have building blocks why people mobilize, what they produce, and how they get organized. Digital media have different structures, different affordances, a network logic that comes before him, anything else, and the discourse that we create. Because, believe it or not, whether we use pictures, videos, we are creating collective narratives. Everything is played out. We don't hit, unless we do strategies like denial of service, like uh, strategies. We don't hit directly people with digital media, but we talk to people. And the power of the words is still a very important one. Okay? So, because it takes two to tango, you take the building blocks of both and you put them together, you adopt a social technical approach, and you try to understand what is happening to the collective effort that you're looking at, that you're studying or do you want to serve as a civic tech activist building something for the movement? The MIT has a tremendously nice um, space for civic tech building. They talk to people, they try to understand what is their need, and then they build things afterwards. And this is purely social technical. <clears throat> and then, once that you've done that, you go back to what is said to be church and supper. To the everyday life, because I started by saying repeatedly that social movement are projects of change, change in our lives, in the way in which we live, in the way in which we approach the final day of our existence, having done something good for ourselves and for everyone else. Follow the white rabbit. So, how do we compose this element? There is a technological opportunity structure. So, so far, we've been concerned with a political opportunity structure, how much the government allows us to participate, a discursive opportunity structure, how much the media have conditioned the way in which movement are portrayed, and then we have now a technological opportunity structure. If the doors are closed, you're going to open that doors through Twitter and Facebook. Okay. You have to train people, you have to take decisions, but you can do that. You have technological opportunities that actually allow um, Egyptian citizens to go beyond, their, to, to, to bypass their um, dictator. Okay? However, 
it's not that when you go online, every use that you make of the platform will come up uh, as revolution. You can simply spread the information and that it's called the super size effect. It's the key to the internet in the first place. The global, global justice movement thrived upon website because that was a quick way of distributing information. But it's taking a small effort and make it bigger. It's a super size thing. So it's not, it's important, but it's not transformative. Another thing is that when you take the media and you use them as tools for your protest, then you start changing how the protest is done. And the third thing is that when you learn protest as a as script for action, look at the downside of this. Acting and protesting for everything creates a lot of confusion. There are people protesting because a TV show has been closed. There are people protesting for the vaccination. There are people protesting everywhere that we actually don't know where to direct our interest. Okay, but protest did not used to be a way of doing things. You could issue a complaint, maybe, but we protest for everything now. Okay, and that is what is truly transformative about digital media because protest has bridged as a way of doing things each of us. And at this point, even people who never mobilized before thought that they could do it. Women, kids, teenagers to categories that often did not go into the squares because it was dangerous, because have a more limited biographical availability, less time, especially if we're talking about women, less resources, constrained by other types of norms, etc., etc. Women do take part to mobilization online. If you look at the data, there are studies that will show you that compared to 10 years ago, a higher number of women mobilized politically because they start from, from getting a point online. Organizing collective action, we are not building the huge manifest, we're not at the same level of the manifestation. We don't do a rally like in Washington on the 21st of January this year, but we do a flash flow model. Come together, disrupt, and then disappear. That actually creates a lot of problems because by the time that we hit, the authorities are already lost and we're, we've gone already. And so they don't really know how to follow us. Think about WikiLeaks, for example. Things about distributed denial of service techniques. Okay? Things about tweet storms. Okay? It's impossible for any authority to get a grip of everybody who actually took part in it. Okay? It's quick, it's fast creates a lot of pressure and sometimes turns out to provoke a change in the agenda, like it happened in the TV show in Italy. Okay? Not all users are the same, I said this before. We all contribute as Mr. or Miss or some, something else, no one, but there are keynotes. And there's a lot of responsibilities on the shoulder of these keynotes, so one of the tasks that we as analysts do very often is try to map this view of Facebook or other <coughs> type of networks to then identify who are the bridges in this conversation. God forbid that a, uh, someone that is particularly dangerous become the hub of a, of a protest because on the shoulder of that hub, the whole protest online can fall apart. And not online networks are the same. So some very distributed network that have actually spread like uh, according to epidemiological models occurred in the case of the Arab Springs. Most of online uh, organized campaign that have an official hashtag tend to be very centralized around a few nodes. So we do have leaders even in online networks. And that is something that you have to learn to live with. Collective action is the action of everybody, but there are leaders. But leadership is fluid. And it's not something that we do because we are someone rather than someone else, because we become from a specific background or another. We are contingent leader because at a specific time point in time we say something that boosts the protest. And after we said that and we got our chain of retweets, leadership passes to someone else. So, 
the way in which we act by making of digital media pieces of our protest repertoires is also something very important. So movement have had one, uh, also in the past since ever, what is called uh, a uh, protest action repertoire, like actors on the stage. Based on the culture of your protest, you protest in different ways. Campesinos in Latin America, they use their tools to block the ropes. They put the trucks, they toss away the fruits that they cultivate because that is part of their culture. In the digital media culture, we use email bombing, denial of service, distributed denial of service. We take platforms and we tune them towards bigger audiences or we keep them restricted to a small pool of people to then get explode together. We can do virtual sit-ins, we can launch very often protest hashtag, we can initiate a group, whatever. Whatever we decide to do though, it's something that you have to remember, it's something that we do freely, but within the boundaries that the platform has set for us. The revolution in Egypt might also be tweeted, but it has been tweeted with tweets, replies, retweets, and mentions. It's being tweeted with the way in which Twitter wanted us to, to tweet that revolution. Okay? Um, how do we become an us? I told you before, we discussed this a little bit already. It's a mixture between using what is on the platforms, the content, what is being called the politics of disability, a little bit of the civic narcissism that we discussed before, taking different pieces of media narratives that are spread around composing them in the space of our profile or our tweet feed or any other platform that we Instagram profile, whatever we want, and displaying it to the others. It's always um, a very fluid tangle, I would say, between what we can do because we are on a certain platform and how we want to appear to the rest of the world, how we want to manifest our political attitude to the others. And as I said, um, it's not easy, especially when a collective has to pass through one single hole to get out to the public, like in the Occupy case. It is not random if you decide that the, the issue today is uh, equal pay. Before tweeting with the, with the uh, account of Occupy about equal pay, two, three hours meeting took place, okay? So, once that you get a sense that you're sharing the cause with thousands of other people, the fact that we become one political subject, one collective effort, is something that is human, socially driven, and it's something that is often done face to face. So this is the reason why digital media do not create a social movement. They intersect social movement. They, together with social movement, they become something else. They create another political subjectivity. I want to close quickly. Um, we started 10 minutes late, so I'm taking five minutes more and then we can take to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the fact that we've been discussing digital media as a background to how protest changes in the in these days, but also uh, without saying actually the obvious truth that the media themselves can become object of the protest. So I can protest about digital media. There's a very long and fascinating story about alternative media. Alternative media, it's all the use, especially in conjunction with social movement, of radio, television, newspaper, from the people outside the boundaries of mainstream media corporations. It's been there forever and it's been a huge resource for fueling a democratic worldwide vision. We know about indigenous people because of the indigenous radio transmission that they've been doing. So internet and social media and digital media in general 
boosts this generation of alternative media to a next level because it's, it's not just the tribe that um, decide to adopt a community radio to speak their voices, it's truly every one of us. And each of us has an alternative view compared to what happens um, uh, out there. Okay, I, I love this picture. Uh, it's a it's a it's a picture that's been in there forever. Actually, it was the cover of my MA. I, I took it and, and, and made of it the cover of my MA dissertation kind of some time ago. Uh, but it is it is all the alternative collapse in in one picture because there are women that are usually not very often represented or are represented in a specific way by the media discourse. The motherhood. The indigenous I mentioned, the fact that traditional media are as can be as alternative as uh, the internet. So it's a tremendous victory, and it's um, it represents the fact that alternative media vision is what it's recalled as a radical media practice in its own right to connect every media system with the citizens, because there's no other thing be behind the media system that it's not informing citizens. Okay. And when the media system gets too detached from the basis that it's supposed to the rape stories to represent, then we do have a problem. So on the shoulders of this long story of alternative media, there's the protest about the digital. Even here we had, in only a few years, a quite a rich environment of protest. At the beginning it was communication rights. Um, when uh, the right to be informed was not perceived to be simply enough anymore. So, because if someone informs you about something, you're taking the narrative that comes from the outside to your daily lives and you're informed. But then, what if you have something back to say? So, changing the idea from information rights to rights to communicate, it was claiming for a right to have a dialogue. Okay, And that has actually imbued a lot of um, the protest around the internet with the idea that besides listening it was also necessary to be able to speak. That has become part of the democratic media activism and has actually fueled the protest on internet governance to make the governance of the internet a participated and necessary participated space. Okay? Then came the hacktivism uh, on the shoulders of Anonymous and Wikileaks, um, inheriting a lot from the previous tradition of hacktivism. When my students come to me um, at, the, at the BA class that I teach in Trinidad, at the University of Trento, they tell me, I want to study this new thing of hacktivism, and ah, it's too bad that you don't know that it's not new at all that hackers have been there for a very long time and the system that you're using today is the result of truly a massive hack amount of hacking activities. Um, and then the data or data came into place and so from hacktivism, a hacktivism or, or media activism we have moved towards data activism. So data activism is the last fringe of a very long term uh, tradition that we have to keep in mind when we address big data or data as a contested issue. And it's something that it's played uh, in between two extremes. So data activism is at the same time a resistance to extensive datafication in our lives, but also an attempt of making of big data a resource in the hands of activists. One thing is giving to activists Facebook. One thing is to give big data to activists my mom, she is an activist, she's a Facebook activist, she has mastered her skills to a certain point to use Facebook in uh, political terms. Give my mom big data, she would probably go in the square and do something else and protest because she wouldn't know how to do it. So transforming big data into a resource for collective protest is something that is happening now, but it's something that is happening with the very large uh, layer of intermediation in between because there are people like us translating the data into something that people then can actually use. Two fields um, that represent these two things, the resistance to gratification, um, zero rating apps, 
um, they simply violate the net neutrality principle. And this collective that it's called XNet, XNet is a Spanish collective, uh, very active. They are very active on digital matters, and they have realized this catchy video just to tell you that zero rating apps are a trap, that they're not fair. But tell anyone that you know what is a zero rating app. They wouldn't know. And the way in which we construct the meaning of zero rating app, of net neutrality, to explain that to common people that use their smartphones and that they are led to privilege zero rating app because they do not want to consume all their data traffic in a month, then we play a crucial role. We are the translators, so we bear a lot of responsibility. Besides resisting <coughs> this thing, the XNet Collective is a collective that actually uses big data to represent network and explain network to people. So this is a discussion, for example, that they've been following for quite some time on the Spanish um, Authors and Editors Association. Know the precise English uh, translation for that. Um, so this is a Twitter network. Okay, common people do not know. Regular people, citizens, so lay citizens, they don't know how to do Twitter network. But if we know how to do Twitter networks, we can control Twitter network and explain Twitter network as pointing to some problems or not. Part of my work is to see how digital media become object of contention within long-standing mobilization. In particular, what I work more often lately is how digital media become part of the feminist movement. Um, I follow different initiatives that are truly bottom-up. There is no normative framework that regulates how terms of services of digital media or internet policies can become or can be, give a flag to online gender-based violence, for example. And there are initiatives like a campaign that I've been following for quite some time now, it's called Take Back the Tech, that have the very difficult task of bringing to evidence what online abuse is at a crossroad between hate speech, bullying, and um, longer-term uh, feminist issues. So, online gender-based violence is not hate speech. Sometimes it's fueled by hate speech, but hate speech is something more general. It can target people for many reasons. Religion, disabilities, a gender-specific view on this, um, on this matter is something that is missing. And so they've been actually working a lot, examining, for example, the policies of Facebook and Twitter uh, to see how, for example, um, terms of use in terms of uh, for, for picture and nudity exposure can become abusive or not. On the one hand, you will see, uh, and that type of, 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 of struggle from the bottom has actually led Facebook to change partially their uh, nudity policies. The breastfeeding thing that you can now expose uh, on Facebook wasn't there in the beginning. It's still very restrictive because Facebook says that you can show female breasts, nothing I said about male nipples, female breasts can be shown in the context of breastfeeding or after a mastectomy. So either you're a mom or you had cancer, otherwise your breast cannot be on Facebook because that is offensive. And so it will take like a whole another week to tell you about all the activities that campaigns like this one do. But the, the good thing about campaigns and many other efforts like Xnet, Take Back the Tag, or many other campaigns, is that they take digital media and they do not take it for granted and they protest how digital media are shaped as object. The practices that some people make out of them and the governance structure and the knowledge basis that is connected to them along the tree petition that we have begun uh, with this talk. So, I've talked a lot. 
hopefully not too much. Um, and this is it for today. If you're interested um, in what I'm doing together with my colleagues, truly not just me, it's a very uh, big group uh, of people distributed uh, within the Cosmos Center in Florence, but also working with physicists and uh, computer scientists uh, at the University of Trento, at the Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Um, this slides will be made available uh, on the course. There's my email address. Florence is just very close. Uh, you can come and take a train. We have a tremendous uh, summer school of media and political participation ongoing next week. If you want to hear two fabulous keynotes, one on Monday by Donatella de la Porta, the uh, director of, of, of the Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences and a very prominent uh, social movement scholar, it's uh, open for participation. We are in Palazzo Strozzi, very close to the train station, so you can come and enjoy the super hot Florence weather now. And then on Friday, Nick Kulti uh, will be speaking from London, uh, prominent media scholar as well. So two very fantastic occasions to uh, also get more sense of the work that has been done. And um, I open the floor for a brief discussion if you want to ask a question, if you have any curiosity. Um, it's not too, too late to do that. Uh, we have that famous 15 minutes that we have. I'm actually just five minutes late compared to the schedule. Um, so. If you have questions, curiosities, or if you if you're working on something and, and any of this is relevant to you, okay, if you just uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Do you want to speak into the mic, maybe, so we can? It's okay. It's in, oh, we can still recording okay. it, and maybe other people can enjoy your question from all people. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to know that uh, how the measure of the movement is assessed by the size of people, by the effect that it has. And the second question is that uh, how we assess that a uh, movement is succeeded or failed? Uh, how? With the okay. what results? And okay. Um, so. When it comes to measuring movements in terms of size and in terms of um, dimensions, I would say, uh, it's not. It, uh, and, and also when it comes to outcomes, it's not easy. Um, and there is no just one way. So what we, um, when it comes to online activism. If we decide that we want to approach a movement starting from a platform, we can use different uh, data. Um, Occupy Wall Street, how many times the hashtag Occupy Wall Street has been tweeted, how many people tweeted with that hashtag, how many people targeted the account of the campaign, um, and the like. Uh, if we go on Facebook, how many like the page has, how active is the response of people to the post of the campaign, how much the campaign responds to the post of the people, this is true also for Twitter and all the other platforms. When it comes to the size in the offline space, that has been a question forever. So you will have the numbers of the organizers that will tell you that a million people marched in Rome in 2013 against the war. And then you have the data from, from the police, La Custura. And that is a formula that tells you how much space there is in a, in a square, for example. And it's calculated on the average space, an average number of people that can actually be in that space. And that is the number that will be given. So neither of the two numbers are, are true. And less and less, the number of people tweeting a protest hashtag is not the people of the movement because it's just 
the number of people that are close to the movement or feel mobilized on the issue of the movement that decided to use Twitter to manifest their presence. Okay, so the size, the dimension of a movement, it's something that you cannot address uniquely, and it's not, not something that you can close up neither to a square nor to a protest hashtag. Okay, the good thing is that you can um, think in, think of the size of a movement, of the dimension of a movement, using other criteria. For example, how long it's been lasting, like. How long did a hashtag circulate online? Was a hashtag more uh, successful than another? Uh, how many offline protest events were um, uh, realized? Uh, so you can, instead of saying how many we were, you can ask the question of how persistent we were. Okay, and that is something that if you put the two things together, maybe you get a solid portrayal of what is happening. The good thing about movement is that they don't really, it's not just the logic of the numbers that matter. It's, in fact, the consequences that they generate. And so when it comes to that, it's another open field, but it's been open way before digital media activism came into place. One uh, level is the personal level. It's the level of biographical outcomes, <clears throat> how being part of a protest affect your political participation patterns over life. We measure that often by interviewing or administering surveys to activists, activists that have retired, activists that have just finished protest events and they're moving on to the next one. Um, the classical uh, measure that we make is policy outcome. How much the claims of a movement are transformed into law or recognizable decisions like closing the TV show, for example. The impact of the online activism are open for investigation. Sometimes the pressure of, that it's created by this flash flow way of organizing are very evident. Closing the TV show or provoke radical changes even inside a political system that are not less evident because they're not supposed to be seen because you don't want to say that WikiLeaks actually transform or the NSA scandal transform the way in which uh, the secret services work within the different states. You're not supposed to know anything about secret services for, one, for that matter, right? But whistleblowing um, leaking documents actually were, were all the distributed denial of service were are rather disruptive tactics that impose to the targets to change the way in which they work because they crack your system once, they can do it anytime that they want. But you're not supposed to see immediately what type of outcome that movement generates, you're not supposed to see it. And then the most difficult thing to measure is the cultural outcome of the movement. But think about the civil rights movements in the states between the 60s and the 70s for racial participation. The fact that we are more keen than before to recognize that racial differences do not matter to our societies is a result of that. Gender uh, women's rights movement from the 70s on with all the changes that both movements have gone through, gender equality is not achieved, but it's less, in some cases, less of an issue than before. Or it's an issue in different terms. We do live in a society that is profoundly different than the society we had in the 50s, and that is because of social movements. Well, a lot has to do with social movement, not everything, but a lot has to do with that. How do we measure? We interview, we reconstruct, um, we work with historians, we work with so some of us, uh, social movement scholars are historians, um, geographers, political scientists, uh, big data analysts. We, we actually work together because social movement consequences are everywhere. And so we really need to work cross disciplinary. If you want to join us and give us some very good ideas, we're open to.
<laughs> collaboration. Thank you. According to Melucci definition of mm -hmm. uh, uh, social movement, when we consider, for example, Ice Bucket Challenge uh, social movement, and if not, uh, which, of, uh, which one of the aspects outlined by uh, Melucci lacked in uh, the movement? So, if I'm not mistaken, the bucket challenge was to raise money, right? So, it had a very immediate uh, goal. When the goal is very, very close um, to your timeline horizon, and then the group of people who come together to achieve that goal is the salt. When the goal is proven to be achieved or it's impossible to achieve, that would be technically called the coalition. So it's a very, it's a collective effort nonetheless, uh, but it's a coalitional one. Because like the movement, as I said before, has a very long-term view, a project that is a radical change of status of the status quo. In fact, what is a movement and what is not a movement sometimes ends up a little bit being a rhetorical exercise, and it's something that would play out very much in our discipline. But the bottom line is, if you start calling everything a social movement, you put on different political subjects a lot of expectation. And so if you call Occupy Wall Street a long-term movement, and you look at what happened at Occupy Wall Street, you will say that it failed, that it was dissolved by uh, police authorities. Whereas I don't think that it failed, because I don't think that that was a movement that was supposed to last long as a peace movement. It was something else. So the idea about calling everything that happens online a social movement is not only an analytical mistake that we scholars don't like. It's putting really too much expectation also what digital media can do for social change. Because in the end, you end up with some, something that you're hearing quite often in these days that internet doesn't work for political participation. It, it doesn't work in some cases, but it does work in other cases. I mean, anonymous works. And it's not because they're super techy people. It's because they use the internet for the things that the internet can be used. You cannot change the paradigm totally and decide your candidates with just an online survey and it's participated by five people. Okay? And when you externalize, the potential of the internet for changing how politics has been done so far, then you're making a mistake because you're a lecturer. You're not thinking that it's it's a very important tool, but it's a tool. Yeah, it's a tool of limitations, right? So mm, I wouldn't call the Ice Bucket Challenge uh, a movement, but it's been very useful for the collective good. And the fact that it's not technically a movement, it doesn't diminish its value its way of acting collectively, and it's a proof that going viral with the, uh, with the, with the social media platforms is, can be useful in enriching, literally and metaphorically. I would say that we are, have come to an end. I really thank you for uh, coming here today. I hope you enjoyed um, this, this, this occasion of confrontation, and I hope you will enjoy also all the other classes that are taking place uh, in the next weeks. You're going to meet some of the most interesting people that I've ever met in my life, uh, and some of them I've never met, and it's, it's a pity that I cannot be here following this class with you, because I would be one of the that would follow this class very closely. It's a very unique occasion, so I really encourage you to um, hold tight and come back to the other classes. And you know where to reach me. And so I hope I see you soon. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.